So ya estamos grabando, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, do this event with you all esta tarde on this rainy day in anticipation for Cinco de Mayo. And so a few things before we get started. And as I mentioned, I do have formal notes. So first thing up, este, me llamo Lilia Rosas, and I am the executive director of Red Salmon Arts. For those of you who do not know, Red Salmon Arts has been, well, we are actually entering our 40th year quietly. We lost track of time, as, as often happens in this thing called um, arts, pandemics, and life. But we are actually en entering 40 years of dedicated Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex, Latino, Latino, Latinx, Indigenous, Native American centered programming that focuses on literature and literacy. And so I want to first thank Raul Alvarez for inviting us to be part of the celebration for Cinco de Mayo. Um, it's been for the artists a difficult and challenging time. And for us, as I keep telling everybody, and if you all have heard me say this before, um, if you don't think art saved you during this pandemic, then you need to really reflect about it because I know it saved me many, many times. So I'm always grateful for all of you and the work you do and the creations you put out in the world and your willingness to take those risks. So with that said, this event is in honor of Cinco de Mayo around the theme of defending democracy and in celebration of the 90, 90th anniversary of Parque Zaragoza. We would like to thank our, um, our other supporters and co-sponsors, the Cultural Arts Division of the City of Austin, Economic Development Department, Amigos de Parque Zaragoza, Austin Saltillo Sister Cities Association, East Austin Conservancy, the Emma C. Barrientos Mexican American Cultural Arts Center, and I would just like to personally note and put there out in the world that El Cinco de Mayo isn't about just drinking margaritas and partying. For many of us, Cinco de Mayo represents a definitive example of indigenous rebellion, where the French not only experienced defeat, but faced the resilience, and I mean that with acepta, of our persistence. And so I think we, um, it is always important to honor um, something that bridges and ties and reminds us of who we are. As we proceed esta tarde, I would like to introduce each of our poetas in the order of their performance. So Irene Lara Silva is the author of three poetry collections, Furia, Blood Sugar Canto, Guacuali, House of Song, which I believe I'm mispronouncing, but she can correct me, and a short story collection, Flesh to Bone, which won Premio Atzlan. Mauricio Novoa, was born and raised in Glenmont, Maryland to Salvadoran refugees. His work has been published in Petagru Review, Blue Mesa Review, the anthology, The Wandering Song, Central Americans Writing in the United States, to name a few. His first full length publication, Memorias from the Beltway, was a joint publication by Red Salmon Press and Flower Song Books. Gris Muñoz is a Chicana of Apache descent, fronteriza, poeta, and storyteller. She is the author of uh, bilingual, um, her work has been highlighted, excuse me, in the bilingual poetry and short story collection, and she is the author of Qualique Girl. Her work has been highlighted as well in Rumpus, Bitch Media, and the Sensosium, hey, perdón, Latino Center, among others. And Joe Reyes Portel is a poet, essayist, playwright. Joe is also a queer, mixed Latinx parent working in community and a former music researcher and novice percussionist. Joe's work includes Michael plus Josephine, a novel in verse by Flower Song Press and the forthcoming chapbook Mouth by Neon Hemlock. Y con eso, we will provide information about all of them as we continue to promote this event, which will clarify any errors I have made here. So miles, miles, miles perdones, because as always, even after, I don't know, 15 years of doing this, I still get nervous and in awe of introducing all of you because you all inspire me. So I would like to turn it over to Irene and then we can continue um, there. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Okay. Mil gracias, Lilia, for that welcome and for the introduction. Um, very honored to share some poems with y'all. Uh, Cinco de Mayo is always a, 
actually any day, all the time, every day, uh, is a good day to share poetry and, and share history and share spirit. Um, I wanted to do a mix of poems, some very old poems and some very and some much newer poems. Uh, this is one that is at least 20 years old, might be older, but it was inspired by a quote uh, that I read in the uh, Esperanza newsletter out of San Antonio. Um, the quote was from uh, uh, Dr. Yolanda Chavez Leva. In recent years, it has become fashionable to write and talk about borders and borderlands, often metaphorically. It is important that we remember that borders are also real physical places with very tangible consequences for those living along the border. La frontera, aquí soñamos de mezcla. We dream of home and to belong. We dream of borders, border crossings, recrossings, of differences, highways taking us to, not from, transformations and symbols born anew. We forget the riverbeds, forget the desert children, cocooned by still mothered bodies, train cars hot then cold with breath and suffocation, bullets fired from anxious guns, ignorant of nationality or life, graves sunken ten bodies deep, the gnarled branches and their rope black ring scars, the quiet cages of malnutrition, miseducation, suspicion, on the border there are bodies. Light, dark, medium bodies, we dream of mezcla and mestizaje, melting, braiding languages. We dream of fusion, combustion, believe in the fertility of chispas, the rolling inevitability of change. This land, this sun, this sky, these hands. But don't forget, the border is littered with bodies lying at crossed angles, a barbed wire fence of flesh and bone. And many gracias to, to Yolanda, who is still out there fighting the fight in El Paso, uh, who is a bright light of, uh, of inspiration and of history. And then I'm also going to read y'all the poem inspired by Langston Hughes poem. For those of y'all that know it will recognize the, the line. Question from the cafe's only brown poet. When do brown people write? Is it all stolen time and creased napkins, the borders of notebooks, used envelopes, time stolen from school and work, children and lovers, sleep? Where do people of color write? Do they write in the kitchen or the bathroom, on moving buses? Do they write in their minds and run over the words, run over the words until they are engraved, making the poems short and few? dark and sparse, hard to find, hard to hear, hard to see on the page. How do they write? Do their lips twist angrily, tongue tripping over languages and words that either way always belong to somebody else? Do they write with spasming hands, fingers clenched like fists, too tight around pens that don't ever flow fast enough? Do they write alone or huddling in groups in turns bracing themselves against winter or heat giving and taking shelter. Where do they write? And what do they write with? Do they write with pens of different colors and inks? I have seen them write with sweat and blood and braided coils of dark hair. I have seen them write with calloused fingers and crumbling stone, blades of grass and strips of fabric from the ragged clothes of their children, their ancestors. I have seen them write on walls and buildings and sidewalks on the soft bark of trees. I have seen them take spray paint and markers to the world because they need to write and free blank white paper is very rare. What do they do when they cannot write? Where do they go when they cannot write? Do they, like dreams deferred, explode? And there we go for the older poems. Going to read y'all a few from the newer collection. Uh, this is the last collection, uh, Kwikakali, uh, House of Song. First poem, you love a river. Ah, a little background. I should say, I'm uh, coming to you all from Austin, and, and my favorite part of Austin is the river that um, that I would cross all the time. And of course, when I was, uh, before we started working from home, I would see it every single day on my way to work and my way home. Um, and so I was going home and looking at the river again, you know, every single afternoon, every morning, and, and this, this poem came to me. You love a river. 
For 20 years, you love a river. And every time you cross it or sit to stare at it, you imagine your suddenly immense hands brushing over its calm ripples, as if it was fur, as if it was skin, as if it could touch you back, as if it also loved you, as if it had waited for you always. This peaceful, uncontested river, always serene, so different from that other river, the river that has defined your entire life. The river you love is far, but not that far from that other river. That other river, sometimes muddy, sometimes dry, sometimes green, sometimes lovely. But you can never think of it without seeing almost two centuries of bloodshed over it. Can never see it without thinking of the lives, the pain, the hurt, the losses crossing that river has cost. You have always loved rivers, but is it still a river if it has walls? This next poem uh, was actually inspired by true events. I had just moved into an apartment complex and we were on the second floor. Somebody kept trying to break into, our, into the apartment by climbing onto the second floor balcony and then trying to get in, trying the doors. And I found myself furious, furious, and I kept threatening to be out there and I was gonna wait in the dark and then whack whoever was trying to come over with a machete. Um, and I remember telling my apartment office this, um, but I, I was so possessed with rage and I, I kept thinking about what, what is this rage about? And then I, I realized where that rage was coming from and this poem was born. Titled, after the third time the would-be burglar climbed into my second floor patio and tried the doors. It is night. It is dark here. I am in the shadows where I cannot be seen from the ground, long bladed machete in hand. I am waiting for those hands, those fingers to grasp at the railing. As he hoists his weight up and over, then quick, quick, I will collect my dew of blood and scream. I am waiting, and as I wait, it comes to me that I am weary of tears, that we are all weary of tears, that my ancestors and my descendants are weeping, and I can hear them weeping, and I can taste their tears, and this is what we have done, and what we have done, and what we have done, until we are sick with grieving. What has been taken, what is being taken, and what will be taken, I am weary of tears. I want blood. I want an infinite machete extending all directions in time. No one will touch my children or my ancestors with violence. Their blood will never be spilled, will never have been spilled, will not be spilling. No dying now or then or to come. No violence, no injury, no hurt. No woman, no child, no man, no person forced against their will. No patch of earth or water or sky violated or polluted, never violated in the time to come or the time that has passed. My infinite machete swung by my infinite strength. I will make a thousand layered necklace of severed hands to rest on my infinite chest. Let the fingers and limbs pile up in my wake. I am weary of tears. I am weary of grieving. They will not touch what is not theirs. They will not touch what is not theirs. The earth is screaming and singing through me, through me unleashed. I will collect my dew of blood and scream. They will not touch what is not theirs. They will not touch what is not theirs. I will take their hands, their fingers, their hearts for wanting, for having wanted what is not theirs. Not theirs, not theirs, not theirs, not theirs, not theirs. There's these bodies, these histories, these dreams, these families, these lands, these skies, these nations, these people, these freedoms, they are not theirs to take. I always need a couple moments after that one to just breathe a little bit. Woo! In the end, we moved away from that apartment so I didn't have to be out there at night. Uh, with a machete. I think I was also threatening to put broken glass and barbed wire on the on the metal too. Who knows whatever happened to them. All right, I'm gonna end with, um, with a poem that was actually gonna be the title poem for uh, for Kuika Kali. Um, it's a poem to Neshtekua, uh, one of the, um, the deities of the afterworld. Um, and Neshtekua translates to the scatterer of ashes. 
The Scatterer of Ashes. What does it mean to be born of a cataclysm? There was one world and then there was another. There is no known number for five centuries of death. We are children of ash, children of fire, children of corpses, children of blood soaked earth, mourning all these centuries because we cannot lay all their spirits to rest. Mourning because new blood revives the cries of old blood. Because new tears fall every day to join the rivers of old tears flowing inside the earth. Mourning because we have seen too many of our own die and the dying has not ended. We mourn the nameless future dead as we mourn the nameless past dead. What offerings can we make to Nishtabua, the scatterer of ashes, when so much has already been sacrificed, been lost, been taken? Scatter the ashes, Nishtabua, and let them rest. What does it mean to be born knowing we are destined for ash? Lay them to rest, Nishtabua. And in return, we offer this. When it is time to scatter our ashes, you will find only flames flickering over our stubborn hearts. Because we are not ash. We are neither dead nor dying, not today. For all our dead, we will live incandescent. We are children of survive, children of struggle, children of sing, children of pray, children of resist. Five centuries of dying has also been five centuries of living, of remembering, of gathering, of building, of stories, of birthing. Neshtebua, we may weep, but even our ashes will sing. Mil gracias. Gracias, Irene. Ooh, yes. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> So we will now este, move on to Mauricio. So whenever you're ready, Mauricio. All right. Thank you, Lilia. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm excited to share work with you all. I only have uh, two pieces to share, one short, one long. So um, the first one I wrote after this, I think last presidential election um, when the early voting took place at the Central Library here in Austin and it's called Outside of the Polling Place. The crowning achievement of a liberal city is making the multi-million dollar Central Library a polling site and no moment captures the liberal city more. The city that is now known for overpriced under seasoned tacos a row of new businesses that were black and brown owned for decades before and more traffic than anyone was prepared for than people posing for pictures of their I voted stickers, believing they're saving democracy from the only evil it has ever known next to people that have stood outside in sweltering summer sun every day who will be denied a home no matter who wins. And the second one I'm going to read is the title poem from my book, Memorias from the Beltway, also called Memorias from the Beltway. Um, one, the bullet entered Romero's chest at mass. A week later, heaven repaid with a plague of rifle rounds through bomb smoke at his funeral. Bappi was 13 old enough to hold a rifle like his friends who brought AKs to birthday parties because military uniform has been bulletproof. He watched friends open friends' games on schoolyard playgrounds and hid from tanks taking his classes roll call. While Abuela sang hymns, he wrote love poems to prove hearts with bullet holes can still beat. Abuelo bounced first from San Salvador to the district almost a decade after hope for the hungry bled onto bread. After BPD released Stop the Violence, Abuelo sent for Abuela and Papi, whose first DC job was at a gas station. A week later, he learned guns have siblings, a familiar cold on the back of his neck as the register was emptied. Two, from their county stamp cruiser, Eyes like street lamps surveil every movement down Urbana Drive and Flax Street, a bullet for anything they can't see. And like the street craters under their wheels, 
the grass in between them and my house depresses from new suspects, new shivers from cold cuffs, new questions of walking away alive. There's even a cavity in the grass from all the Yankee fitted brims, pummeled for whatever invented offense, barely missing my sidewalk. Three, but sometimes life is carne asada, drunk uncles and soccer balls soaring over fences into neighbors' yards who don't give a fuck how many times we have to hop to get them back. They say get that too. That's vecino for a play that shit all night if you want. No noise complaints here. Four, watch maps fly farther than our dreams. Watch children try to find El Salvador between red line stations on metro directories. Watch fathers and mothers escape borders, but their children never leave the beltway. Now watch their older cousins in Yankee fitted caps, a 24 Laker jersey, and a cowboy's case on their phones with a messy background. Take us to New York, Detroit, Compton, and watch us take notebooks and try to bring them back to the beltway. Five. Squad cars roll slow, heavy like tanks leaving imprints on our sense of safety. You would think the 13 year old sitting in the back seat had brought a rifle and aimed it at somebody's chest, but no, he set off a stink bomb. No one died that day, though some who watched them in cuffs will years later, but at least 64 bullets and four sidearms stop our hearts and beg to open them, rattling the clip staring longingly up the barrel, praying to leave brim and prints in front of this middle school. And we stare with tunnel vision past the flashing lights at the street lamp, praying we pass under in an hour heading home, notebooks without bullet holes. Six, we hit the courts with three hours of sun left because we wanted to go home with our shoes. Just as scrub league was about to commence, two guys asked to play. We didn't want to embarrass ourselves, but we said yes anyways. We made sure to split them up in case they were any good. Who remembers how anyone played, but we thought we shot through time quick enough. One of the two said he just got home the week before. It didn't matter how long he was gone or why. No one gave him a scholarship to ball anywhere, and they made sure no one ever would. Even if he could or couldn't dunk on us every play, even if his GPA was higher than our points per game. Most of us never leave, but teammates stolen from us outnumber our hundreds of missed shots. We never got a rematch. Seven. Saturday nights, we're sitting in the corner of a room in Beltsville as 15 cousins play Mario Kart, writing the Tupac and game beats, playing over the chorus of Beos and BS shit talk in the living room. The paper is passed around because they want to follow up from last week's freestyle number three. Summer breezes were sleeping over at the Virginia cousin's house, knowing that waking up the next morning is watching G-Unit videos on his family computer and showing him a notebook full of Nas imitations. A normal day is a cold Glenmont basement, Papi gone for days, plowing snow for sub-zero paychecks after presents, mommy on the metro next to the white people, whose $230 a night toilet she just cleaned. Me looking at rejection notices feeling like Kanye. Like, damn, is everyone else that much better than me? Eight, Kevin Durant was drafted in 2007 by the Oklahoma City Thunder because he practiced his jumper since he was little, with coaches correcting his mistakes, watching Jordan and Iverson on TV. So what if instead of reading Lord of the Flies or Robert Frost every year, Someone assigned Sonia Sanchez. If someone showed me how to paint an empty fridge with words instead of the multiple fonts X come in, would I still be waiting for a rookie contract? Nine. It's not supposed, I'm not supposed to take it personal, but it feels like my pockets were stolen just as I thought I was about to fill them. Was all this practice just been with no weight, like Pops getting ahead in America? We were counterfeiting meal tickets in our school at school hallway. I got cocky enough to think I could forge a plane ticket out of rhyme and hope boiled from a lot of scratch off dust. My ass still covered in the gravel for mommy's stoop. Hanging hip hop posters was like screwing in a small light bulb in dark auditorium, 
Rhapsody's voice, the sound you follow to find the light switch. I still chug beer from the bottle, craving a sip of the milk rent bills drank up, still trying to read no was quit, still standing on Pac's shoulders, trying to get hang time like Jordan instead of an Earl Manigault rebound because we're born with loaded rifles into echo chambers where everyone yells shoot and the music jammed the gun. Thank you. Amazing. Los dos, gracias. Y ahora, Gris. I'm going to be reading a few selections from um, Guatliqua Girl. Who, uh, Guatliqua Girl uh, just kind of celebrated its year anniversary, or she just celebrated her year anniversary. So I'm just very, very grateful for all of the growth that I've experienced in the last year and how much, how much this little book has healed me and it's healed my spirit. Um, I'm going to be reading just a, a few pieces from that. Um, this one is called Rivers. There are rivers, crystalline and finely twisted, fanning out like blazing bolts of lightning, gliding, slicing through the darkened earth. Rivers that end up bent at the waist, choked dry by decisions men make. Um, I'm gonna read a short piece and you know, I'm thinking about all the ways in which uh, we resist, right? And um, so I'm a, a queer writer, I'm a bisexual writer um, from the border. And so I thought I would read a few selections uh, from Guadalupe Girl that are uh, about that queerness because um, that's also a form of resistance, right? Um, especially when it comes to identity. And um, so um, this one's called Manflowers. There was a house on the other side of our block. Ahí viven las manfloras, my mom would say, the disgust in her voice palpable. Si algún día te ofrecen comida, no la tomes. Whenever we had to walk by, she would grasp onto my hand even tighter and hurry me along. The house didn't really look any different from others on the block. It was white brick with a forest green trim, and there was a gray pebble walkway down the middle of the yard that led to the door. There was always so much noise and movement at our house. I liked riding my bike out there, out of there, pedaling down our driveway and taking the sidewalk away from everyone. My mom wouldn't really mind if I was gone unless I was gone too long. Once I was really going, I'd count the thin lines that separated the sidewalk into the neat squares, feeling each bump under my tires. Las Manfloras. I was pretty sure I knew what it meant. Women who were like men, who lived together like lovers. I like the word manflowers better. I'd say it in my head and think about the word, imagining what type of plant manflowers would be if they really existed. Following the curve of the sidewalk, I'd ride faster, picking up speed until I was close, and then I'd glide past their house. There was a gnarled wild blackberry tree in the yard, and at the base of it, a growth of succulents that were always freshly watered. Moras. The blackberries were called moras and my parents thought they were a nuisance. My dad would say they were too bitter to eat and complain how in the summer the moras would hang fat and heavy until they stained the sidewalk because our neighbor Chewy was too lazy to look after his trees. My friend Rosie lived on that side of the block and when I'd go over, her mom would let us ride our bikes anywhere on the street. We liked the moras. When we'd get to the manflower's house, we'd slow down 
and wipe, walk our bikes up the driveway. There would be purple stains all over the sidewalk and front yard. And we'd gather the plumpest ones and pile them into our bike baskets for pretend doll food. We'd eat them instead, laughing and squeezing as we plunged them into our mouths, the juice sanguine and bitter. Sitting crouched, I'd look up at notice and notice Rosie's smiling face. It was spotted with moving shadows from leaves that in flashes blocked the sunlight. It wasn't until after I became a single mother that I learned about queer brown love, how it was the truest, like wrapping your arms around your very own skin in another body, the scent of body lotion and familiar. It was the first woman I loved who had gently said, I think you have postpartum depression, sweetheart. No one else had noticed. My daughter was almost two. Anna. She'd stop by on Sunday mornings with groceries. You didn't have to, I'd say. But she knew we were probably a little hungry. I'd boil sweet potatoes as Belen sat and tapped plastic measuring cups against the kitchen tile. I'm on my way to see cat eyes. We met out dancing. I remember noticing her joy, how evident it was as she moved to the cumbias the live band was playing. Nervously, I had a couple of shots of tequila before catching her eye and holding my arm out, asking her to dance. I'd never had that feeling of a woman's body and her moving near me, the perfume off her shoulders and my pure joy in being. I was wearing a pair of cowboy boots and even then had never been so graceful. Can I tell you something about cat eyes? I later found out she supported herself and her babies on her own, working part-time and taking on all the duties of a full-time nursing student. She only had one night, Saturday, off from her kids every two weeks. Even if she was completely spent, she made it a point to go dancing. The rest of her every day, she was up by 5 a.m. It's actually my birthday and I'm parked outside her apartment. She has about two hours before she has to pick up her kids. I hadn't planned on doing anything for it, but when I'd mentioned it to her, she insisted on making lunch. Once inside, I sat at her kitchen table and watched her make salsa. She was roasting chiles and chopping onions next to a large granite molcajete. I feel special, I said, our eyes meeting. You are Reina, she responded. Her apartment had plants everywhere, succulents, and tiny repotted aloes arranged, lining every counter. I got up and leaned towards her, our arms wrapped around another tightly like vine, violet mouth kissing. <sighs> I love that story. Um, I'm also going to read another poem, uh, also about that queer resistance, right? And. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm a romantic, so my my work tends to be, you know, uh, very sen very sensual, and and hopefully very very filled with with cariño. Uh, Claudia, we never knew when it was morning. Legs entwined. I would watch her standing at the stove to make espresso from an antique tin. A sculptor, one night, she hung glass bottles from the ceiling with twine. They would clink with the wind. I would watch her standing at the stove to make espresso from an antique tin. It had been her grandmother's, she said. 
The bottles would clink with the wind in that basement apartment with no furniture except for that four-poster bed. It had been her grandmother's, she had said. A sculptor. One night, she hung glass bottles from the ceiling with twine in the basement apartment with no furniture except for that four-poster bed. We never knew when it was morning, legs and twine. <sighs> okay, and now I'm gonna read just one last short piece um, and it's called Dos Pencas and it's really about border life. And I just like, one of the things I love about Guadalupe Girl is that it's illustrated by the very famous uh, duo Los Dos. Uh, they are on the border. They are a uh, very well-known uh, husband and wife mural and fine art duo, uh, Cristian and Ramon Cárdenas. And most recently, uh, you can see their work. They actually de uh, designed the flyers for the Rage Against the Machine tour. So they are like, you know, just super famous, incredible, but they're friends of mine. And um, they actually illustrated my book for next to nothing and they let me pay them in, in payments here and there. Um, and so it's just been an incredible uh, collaboration with them as well. And so I really like uh, the piece that goes along with uh, Dos Pencas. So that's my last, uh, my closing piece. Dos Pencas. Entre dos venas, dos venas estoy Flor de dos pencas, de dos pencas soy. Pajarito, platícame de los vientos cálidos y ricos, de vivir en el cielo en tu nido escondido, que de aquí solo tomo de este río fermentado, rendido. Flor de agave, en la frontera vivo y lloro. Y lloro, aguardiente frío. Thank you. Gracias, Chris. Y para terminar, last, never, never, ever least, Joe. I'm, I'm totally humbled to be in this group. Just really thankful. Uh, thanks to those who invited us. Thanks, Delia. Thanks to Red Salmon Arts and Asistencia Bookstore always just for being present, right? Even um, through throughout, no matter what is happening with you or the bookstore, you're present and that's beautiful. I have two pieces I wanna share. They're both a little longer, so I'll, I'll start right away. Uh, here's a prose piece called Figs. I was late and hungry and out of breath when I got to work. Once at my desk, I opened the package of figs and read the news. With each fig, I think of desire, how of any fruit, it should have been the fig that tempted Eve. In all chaos of the office, I have the idea of, the, of desire sinking into me, how the fig with its pocket of honeyed syrup promises sweetness, but requires transformation of the person biting into it, how it rewards that person. It takes me hours to read this one article because I'm busy pretending to work and reading the news and making coffee and greeting the incoming and switching out the water cooler water bottle after dragging it through two rooms. In between, I eat all 10 suede skin bulbs. Their skins so much like the space between finger and thumb meant to be caressed and if squeezed, to reveal a grainy kind of pain. With so many figs, I realized their differences, some with thicker skins, some with more pith, some with the rosy inside full like my young girl hair, some not so abundant in the crunchy seeds, more of the softness surrounding those seeds, shy or reserved, and with each one an increasing reaction to how they change my mouth. As I eat, I read a story in The Guardian about a father and his daughter who are being held in detention but are threatened daily with separation. The father is ordered 
is offered deals by the U.S. to return to Guatemala. It's said in these asylum cases, the danger of returning must be proven. Parental concern for a better life isn't enough. Still, his lawyer sells him on the idea of a better life. The lawyer doesn't say it's the American dream that will increase his chance of returning to the other side. All the while, the little girl thinks she's been on a vacation and she's hungry. And this is the worst vacation that her father can't ask for food, can't walk into the kitchen and come back with an apple or some cheese. She's seven. If they stay any longer, her stomach will learn to be hungry only when meals are offered because it serves no purpose to be hungry when there's no food. For now, she's mad. Her father says she's always been strong-willed, but now she's changed. Anger unfurls within her. I think of the wasp, who's compelled to pollinate the virgin flower, knowing to do so means their own death. And I stay angry with myself for denying hunger. I get mad. In my understanding, most women are mad, are mad. Most are hungry and will not feed ourselves. Why not be like the wasp who enters the flower that is not yet fruit and not yet gorgeous purple skin and toothy white and luscious blood pink in her flesh? Not yet, but will be. Still, the wasp trusts. This is a heavy handed metaphor. The fig is not a fruit. It's a flower inverted and requires an action to become the small fist I hold so carelessly in my hand. This becomes my metaphor for America itself, which offers only the idea of an American dream. Attaining it is a whole other matter. And that the desire of a good life is possible at all is a trick we sell to ourselves and others. It is in fact a slippery thing requiring all of our breath suffocating us. The denial of desire isn't just the families attempting to come through, but a dampening over generations to slow our bodies and minds until we grow cold. I think of the man I routinely do editing work with. He's texted me a poem he wrote about God, and I think it sounds very much like desire. There's a word he repeats, Almost every line repeats enough that I learn to accept it and open my mind to it, longing. And in the one line where it isn't present, I miss it terribly. This is only a seven line poem, but I'm caught like a cicada by its fresh skin and wet wings. He asked me to share a poem and I move away from desire into conquering. These are related. We've been taught to conquer what we desire. If we don't, someone else will conquer us. In the poem I send to him, I ask about the unknown reader. What will the moon be called after the last conqueror has died? What will we name it? But this man brings me back to tenderness. Even when he sees his daughter laid out on a hospital bed in the poem, how does he doubt himself? I don't see it. To me, he is a father, all blood and muscle, solid and sure. Same as the father of our small, hungry girl who himself has changed in the face of this desire, this need for happily ever after. I've always wanted to share poems with someone who understood what I was reaching toward. I just never thought it would be a man, a white, straight, married, cis man because there is intimacy in sharing work and I'm desperate to know it, to know myself and to give myself up. Some part of me worth dying to let this through. He doesn't know all of what I'm thinking, but he must know I'm contemplating something. And still he says, share with me. I hesitate. The thump of language grows in my body. The stretch some words require is difficult because this body is temporary but the sounding out of our ideals is forever and growing. Each word, a wasp becoming a flower, a death drum leading the wasp on, a cadence that must be released or it risks becoming anger. The child to hunger, to anger, a parent who begins to fear they cannot hold this thing back, a parent now filled with their own fear of desire. The taste of desire made astringent within the fig's skin a talk across the tongue and teeth down the throat 
to remind the world that desire is a promise that cannot be so easily taken, no matter how elusive, to remind the person who believes in the order of things that there are rules in the beast of the country, but those rules are nothing compared to the laws of the body, to search, to want into existing, to consume and be changed, transformation breaking each of us, like teeth cutting across a fig's evening blossom. That was I always mess that one up when I read because it's just a lot in my head still. Um, I'd like to close with a, it's a, a meta poem. So it's a poem about a poem I had to write, like the process of writing a poem. And uh, I was asked to write a poem in response to the two year anniversary of the Remain in Mexico policy, um, MPP or the migrant uh, mig migration protection protocols. And um, uh, yeah, there's no way you can <laughs> address the, just the sheer number of people who've been affected, right? At the border who've been denied entry. And I know that Biden has done some work toward that, but I don't think that it's enough to undo the previous administration. Um, that's not progress. That's cleaning up what we ourselves messed up. So there's still a lot of progress to be done. So here's this poem. Because I've been asked to speak about migration policy in the face of American tendencies. Me, who can't find American within my bones in America who herself does not recognize me. But Deborah or Debbie, her name changes, her last name too, doesn't know this. She's running from one corner of the room to another, pulling documents while she attempts to ask me flippantly to write a poem for the vigil she's holding. The entire world is in a vigil right now, I think. To address the two years since the government refused to welcome migrants through, I tell her yes. Yes, when I have no idea what to say. Yes, when I've spent the two years pretending this wasn't happening. This is happening. I have one week, surely that's enough time. All that has managed to stay with me is the conversation I overheard between my mother and an immigration officer. He tells her, Americans only have two names. Choose one last name and one first name and let the rest go. He tells her, your father's last name is problematic. You don't wanna be connected to that, do you? He tells her, keep your husband's name. You chose to marry, it's best. She loses her middle name, belonging to a saint, and her last name, the, the last co connection to her homeland. She becomes a flower gifted by a king. Migration protection protocols, it's called. Although everyone calls it remain in Mexico. Americans blame Mexicans for all that is wrong on this land and anyone who is not Mexican becomes Mexican. This is an American tendency to blame what is within arm's reach on those who are left holding. There are tent cities now that rival the United Nations and the violence and inequities they were fleeing have met them there. And activists call those who seek asylum the voiceless and they serve as translators for them. I remember my mom crying when we walked home after school registration. I was five and the older teacher kept telling her, speak English so your child does better in school. I became invisible at that table. This woman not seen, I was capable of anything. My mother is lost momentarily, again, standing on the playground at her own school, children laughing at her clothes and her way of speaking. How the house turned cold that afternoon when she told my father, tenemos que hablar español a la niña. This was the last way they knew to protect me, to acquiesce. It's Friday. And the vigil's tonight and I do not have a poem. Deborah texts me through the week to see how I'm progressing. I lie. I've spent the week looking over photographs and articles until my eyes would not shut, until every pixel and every image is screaming. I managed to write something about how the true voiceless are those who will not listen anyway, who frame their fear into the delusion of being right. So right they don't bother to question it. Assume everyone holds the same belief. This is my America. I go line by line, barely holding this poem. Speaking becomes increasingly difficult. I swallow words, my eyes fail me. 
Here I am, America. My flesh pulsating on both sides of this argument. Deborah is without words. Everyone is silent. I mouth, thank you. Gracias. I don't know if people want to mute themselves, pero in all gratitude, y con todos este sentimiento, I am just grateful that we got to spend this afternoon with torrential rain and probably a pen impending este tornado watches and anything else that's going to sweep us away. Aquí we are here. So as always, I have to say this, support your artistas, support your poetas, support this event. I will provide more information for everyone who witnesses this to make sure that you all get these amazing poetas books in plural, porque nunca puede ver suficientes libros en la vida. And if you think you have too many, then give some away to someone who needs them. So we will end there. And adios a todos. Thank you.